Did you see that? Yes. Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Well, I think well, I think we're on our way. The, the technological bit is always the most challenging of all, I'm afraid. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you. This is the first time I've done an, an international talk uh, across international boundaries. So it's a, it's a first time for us all as well. Um, really, I think most of my career I was dealing with soft rocks. Uh, so that um, what I've indulged myself in uh, mostly since I retired, has been looking at things which every geologist gets quite excited about. And we all get quite excited about volcanic rocks. Uh, they are perhaps some of the most exciting things that we have around in geology. So I'm looking at this pretty much from an amateur point of view. You know, the great thing about being a geologist is that you can't go anywhere in the world and you'll find something of interest. So these are the things which have interested me over the years. Well, here I am in Edinburgh. Welcome to my study. Uh, I live in Edinburgh, a volcanic city, which is really quite tranquil at the present moment, you know, yet all around me, you see evidence of volcanic activity in the past. So 350 million years ago, Edinburgh would have been a somewhat more dramatic place than it is today. But I think it's important to actually understand something about what the, the volcanic provinces are, are like, and also about the impact of volcanic activity on the people that actually live there. So I'm hoping that I might introduce you a little bit to that in the past. But first of all, I've got to, there's a wee man in Scotland who used to come up with the phrase, we're doomed, we're all doomed. And when you look at what might be the, the things that are facing human society in the future, you know, pandemics, yes, we're experiencing those, but also super volcanoes and all sorts of other things as well. These are the things which are high up in the list of the biggest threats to humanity. And taking a look at what's happened in the past, there have been some pretty big volcanic eruptions. Krakatoa, 1883, was a fairly large volcanic eruption, producing vast quantities of rock, ash, and pumice, killing a significant number of people, 40,000 people. And that's a, a conservative estimate. And perhaps the eruption itself was one of the, the loudest bits of noise that's ever been heard in modern history. But it also had a, an impact globally. And you'll perhaps recognize this painting here. It's the, it's the scream which was painted by a Norwegian artist round about the same time as Krakatoa was erupting. But it, is, it tells a story, I think, and geology is all about telling stories. It tells a story about the, of the impact of that volcanic eruption on people. Because not just was there rock, ash, and pumice thrown up into the upper atmosphere, spreading out so that they had a couple of days that were completely dark, but it also threw up a whole lot of sulfur dioxide. And that sulfur dioxide changed into sulfate ions. These produce small particles that we call aerosols, and these could reflect back the, the light of the sun. So as a result of that, less sunlight hitted the Northern Hemisphere, and summer temperatures fell almost by as much as 1.2 degrees centigrade. So, you know, there's two sides to every story. On one side, we get very worried about climate change and the planet heating up, and that's certainly something we should all be concerned about. But on the other side, we've got these ice house gases, which can actually cool the planet down. And we see the effects of those every time there is a volcanic eruption. And that volcanic eruption in Krakatoa is still going on because even within the caldera of Krakatoa itself, Ankh Krakatoa was erupting on the 10th of April, 2020. So these things are still going on. So what does we as geologists, how do we get to understand and mitigate against the, the opportunities of volcanic eruptions which will undoubtedly pop up in the future? Well, fortunately, we now have this concept of plate tectonics, which I believe Betty talked to you about three years ago, I think, or something. 
Well, plate tectonics, well, would you believe it? When I was at university, plate tectonics hadn't been invented. Mind you, I did graduate from Aberdeen, and it takes a long time for new ideas to percolate to that remote part of the world. But it certainly wasn't part of the curriculum. We were still talking about geosynclines and geanticlines and goodness knows what all. But here we have plate tectonics now, which is this unifying paradigm that allows us to understand things and understand things far better and to link in different aspects of geology into a whole earth system. So we have the, the distribution of earthquakes and volcanoes which define the rigid plates that occur at the surface. Uh, but we also have some idea about what's about how this actually emerged. And, you know, just looking at the characters who were involved in this, James Hutton and his Earth's heat engine, Alfred Wegener and his continental drift, Mari Tharp, I'm a great fan of Mari Tharp. She actually discovered the mid-ocean ridge, for goodness sake. Harold Hess and Tuzo Wilson both actually contributed to the, the whole concept. And then in the end, we've got Dan Dan, the plate tectonic man, uh, Dan McKenzie from Cambridge, who, who, who put the whole thing together in some sort of mathematical model. So it, it demonstrates one of the things that's fundamental in any sort of science. As we move on, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And here are a few of the people, the giants, who gave us this concept of continental drift. But there you go, here we've got this plate tectonic model. And this evening, I think I want to take you to three places that I've had a little bit of experience of that uh, I think are really quite interesting in actually demonstrating just what plate tectonics does in terms of producing volcanic activity. We've got mid-ocean ridges where you've got magma coming up and spreading out and the opening up of, of, of oceans. You've got places where oceanic crust is subducting underneath continental crust. Sometimes it's subducting underneath oceanic crust, as we have across here. And also we've got places where we have hot spots where we're developing shield volcanoes here. So we'll go and visit some of these places and see just what happens. But just to start with, I think I've got to give you some good news. I, I, I said earlier on, we're doomed, we're all doomed. That, that, that's the gloomy side of all this. But really, there's a positive side to it as well. And the message I want you to take away is that we're moving away from Donald Trump at the rate at which my fingernails grow. So, you know, there's a fun side and a good side to everything. The mid-ocean ridge is causing the Atlantic Ocean to get bigger at the rate at which my fingernails grow. And that, of course, produces volcanic activity. And volcanic activity is best exemplified in Iceland. Iceland, a land which is oh, renowned globally for its volcanic activity, attracts the tourists to see it, but also a land which has a, a number of very significant ice caps, the biggest being Vatnajökull down here. So, you know, if you go to Iceland, you get the smell of uh, hydrogen sulfide coming off of things, and you go and visit the, uh, the geysers. And you see something of the interaction between groundwater, water, and hot rocks. And perhaps that's going to be one of the, the subtexts that'll run through the whole of this uh, talk about the interaction between water and the role water plays in various volcanic activities. So here we have Iceland, a place where the mid-ocean ridge can be seen to be opening up, forming these fractures. The Icelanders have got the, the, the foresight to build a bridge over one of these fractures. There's a whole series of them. And there you can stand on that bridge and shake hands. And on one side, you're standing on the European plate, and on the other side, you're standing on the American plate. And yes, you can do that on land, but if you've got a bit of scuba diving, you can also do it underneath the water as well. So it opens up, but it opens up also producing volcanic activity. A few years ago, 
you will remember that there was a great deal of huff and, and all sorts of things going on where we had an eruption of Eafaliokul. And Eafaliokul was one of those eruptions that took place underneath the Vatniokul ice cap. And what I want you to imagine tonight is magma at a thousand degrees centigrade rising up within the Earth's crust, encountering the ice cap. And of course, as soon as the hot magma encounters the ice cap, you get the ice changing to water, the water taking to changing to superheated steam with an enormous expansion in volume. And that, that cloud of superheated steam takes it up over a very wide area indeed. And this is really one of the first times we had encountered this. As a result, governments across the Northern Hemisphere stopped all aircraft flying within that airspace. It had an enormous impact on the, the econo economics of any of these countries, just as we were finding the pandemic having that e economic impact at the present time. But if that dust had gone into a jet engine, it would have melted, it would have solidified the jet engine, and would have had aircraft coming down and the loss of life that's associated with that. So they were absolutely right in actually banning aircraft flying across the Northern Hemisphere, regardless of the economic consequence. And of course now, as a local eruption, we now, in the, certainly in the UK uh, risk register, and I dare say in the Irish risk register as well, we have an eruption in Iceland as being one of the risks which any government has got to, to take proper cognizance of. And of course, is it going to happen again? Well, I think so. I was listening to a lecture given uh, just the other night by a chap that Betty will remember, uh, Dave McGarvey, who was talking about his work on Grimsbottom, and he's quite convinced that uh, within the next I'm not going to say for the people of Scotland, I'm going to say for the people of Ireland. And of course here is a model which has been produced by NOAA, the US, and it shows the impact of a volcanic eruption here, and the dust cloud which might come down. Come up this part, I, I understand some of you actually might be living in this part of the world, and then how it swings round and covers much of the rest of Europe. So it's something to take cognizance of. These models will be variable, I dare say, but it's certainly something that will have an impact on all of us as time goes by. So that's Iceland. That's the mid-ocean ridge and everything it's going to do for us. Now I want to take you somewhere else and look at something in the, which it, where the plate tectonics is a bit more complicated. And I'll explain that a little bit later. But where we've got subduction of oceanic crust underneath a, a small part of continental crust and also there's a little bit of subduction going on underneath a, a bit of oceanic crust as well. And that place is the North Island of New Zealand. It's quite complex there. We, the continental crust we have is out here, but it's the remnant of a pre-existing continental crust that's still there in the, the Challenger uh, Plateau. Uh, and we've got the Pacific Plate moving there underneath the Australian Plate. What's the consequences of that? Well, the consequences of that are some fairly dramatic Super volcanoes. Tongari the Tongariro crossing is a, a, a crossing which I would advise any geologist to do if they end up in North Island. It's a, a lovely walk and of course as you walk across you will encounter Mount Nagurahoi which should be familiar to all of you because that was Mount Doom in the films of the Lord of the Rings and uh, that's, uh, that's me there. Tongariro is still active. 
It has lots of fumaroles on it, producing significant amounts of steam. It's got the volcanic lakes with, with salts in them, giving these rather spectacular colours as well. And here we have this, this a young lady I managed to pick up in the Green Man Irish Bar in Wellington. But rest assured, this young lady is actually my daughter, so you don't need to worry too much about me models. But she's got her hands on hot rocks. So, uh, well, it must be about six years ago now, uh, Sarah phoned me up from, yes indeed, the Green Man Irish Bar in Wellington, and said, Dad, I want to travel down to uh, Wanaka in the South Island to work in the, in the ski industry over the winter, but I want to tr travel around in New Zealand for a bit yet. Do you fancy coming with me? So what does a, a father do given an invitation like that? So I went off and spent a month with Sarah. Uh, I introduced her to volcanic activity in North Island, and she introduced me to Marlborough white wine in South Island. So I reckon I got the best bit of the deal. But she's got her hands on some hot rocks there. But from Tongariro, just coming off Tongariro, You can look across the vast town, and the caldera itself just represents the area that is sunk in to the magma chamber that was underneath that has been evacuated during a, a massive volcanic eruption. And it just epitomizes the size of some of these things. And if, if Taipo were to go off again, it would have a, a global significance. I'm quite sure of that. But what else is going on? Well, this is an island that you might recognize. It's White Island, what, what I call White Island anyway. And it's a place that Sarah and I managed to visit on our visit to, uh, to North Island. There's us there, hard hats, hey, gas masks as well. This is a very active volcanic island. And you know, as you walk across it, you've got a lot of fumarol activity giving off mostly steam, but a bit of hydrogen sulfide as well. Uh, lots of sulfur salts, and uh, the, this is an area that was used and was mined for, for sulfur for, for a goodly number of years. And every now and again, one of the miners used to disappear, usually because of some sort of volcanic eruption, uh, minor volcanic eruption during the night. But, you know, if we're walking in, into the whole near of the crater, uh, what we see is... Lot of steam coming up, but that was just a, a pool of, of steam coming out of it. But I want to show you a bit of film footage that was taken by other people who are on the island. And this film footage was shown on uh, New Zealand television shortly after a fairly dramatic event on White Island. The hard hatted tourist moving closer to the and as you can what see, it's like pretty much exactly the same as it was when Sarah and I visited. And the wind is picking up. A guide fires out back. Perhaps a little bit more. The same sort of yellow pools, hot water. A lot of the fumaroles with sulfur round about them. Filming hard hat on along with glasses and a face mask. Others around continue to climb to the crate. Next. Seen them milling, looking relaxed, just a few steps from the edge of what looks like a pond of steam. It was a lot smaller itself, it caused by uh, the magma chamber. And and it's useful to note that round of seismic stations aimed at actually being able to predict when any volcanic eruption. 
takes place or is about to take place. The same sort of thing as we were seeing in Tongariro. The video jumps ahead and they're back near the sea. It's utterly picturesque as they reach the jetty. The pickup boat's heading in to collect them. The camera does a complete 180 and catches the stragglers bringing up the rear before it tilts down to Alessandro's watch. It's about 11 minutes to two. Two minutes before the whole thing goes gaga. This tour group makes it safely back to their boat. Then this, against the backdrop of a roaring boat, engine and an almost cloudless sky. And so the caddy of White Island goes up. Let's look at the next one. There we go. Come away. It does this sometimes. Oh. Sorry, I want to go back. There you go. Let's see if we can get this going. Come on. You're missing the dramatic bit of it. There we go. Now, what's coming out there, people who are left on the island, they, they weren't affected by magma coming into the atom, but what they were was severely burned by superheated steam. And that's a terrible way to, to go, I think, for anybody. But the whole of the island is really enveloped in this cloud of superheated steam. What starts as an angry mottled steam cloud bursting out of Bacardi. In seconds it morphs into an utterly enormous mushroom that appears to swallow the entire island before it starts oozing out into the ocean, this lethal concoction against the backdrop of a dazzling calm blue sky. Background of a dazzling calm blue sky and tourists were still out there on the island. These The ones that were on the boat were the lucky ones. They actually did manage to get away. So I think it's quite useful just to have a look and see what it's like now. What it's like now. And here, oh, keep pressing the button too much. And here we have a bit of um, drone footage just flying over the island. And this was just taken a couple of so it's still puffing away, but you know, the, the amount of activity is very much less. And of course, the, uh, the steam eruption, the phreatic eruption that took place there, it didn't last very long. And you may ask, why was this not predicted when there was so much monitoring going on at the same time? Well, it, and monitor when magma is moving through a, a, a rock texture, but it's much more difficult to, to monitor where water is running through uh, a, a rock matrix as well. So there we go, we've got a, a fairly dramatic uh, volcano that's associated with that and part of a much bigger uh, volcanic province as well. But finally, I want to take you to this location here. I want to take you to an area which has a, a hot spot underneath it and material erupting at the surface here. And of course, that is the Hawaiian volcano. And I was very fortunate. I went out there with uh, Dave Rothery and uh, we went out just, in, <laughs> just as the volcano was beginning to blow its top. So this had both good sides to it and bad sides to it. The good side to it is that, yes, we were there when the volcano was going off and you were able to see the real thing. But the, the downside 
of it was that uh, we were supposed to be uh, living in the, the um, military camp at Kilauea there, but we had to be evacuated out. And we would have been evacuated out for the very good reason that they were concerned that the magma was dropping within the, the caldera itself. They were concerned that water, groundwater, would move into the caldera and we'd have exactly the same sort of situation as we've just seen in Fakari in White Island in New Zealand with a, with a, a steam eruption. But, you know, if you want to see what uh, lava is like, and particularly this sort of basaltic lava, then, you know, Hawaii is definitely the place to go. You know, here we've got some different lava flows there. It's a, a wonderful place to see lava flows. And you can discriminate between the different chronologies of lava, just almost on the basis of color. So the older lava, the brown lava here, has been just slightly weathered and vegetation is beginning to, to grow on it. But also you can see much more modern lava flowing across the top of it, uh, just leaving this dark, this uh, brown material uh, poking out. And if you look at that in detail, here's a, a, a nice little picture of the, the older lava just poking through the younger stuff. And of course, that younger stuff, you can actually see the flow banding within it. This is what they call pahoe hoi lava. And if you want to know why they call it pahoe hoi, well, you just take your shoes off, you walk across the top of it, and it's beautifully smooth, lovely and smooth. On the other hand, there's another sort of, of lava, which is called aa -ah lava. And if you walk across the top of it, it's much more spiky. And immediately you start going ah, 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 as you cross the lava. So it's, uh, it's there for very good reasons. And obviously geologists take uh, good care in making sure that the names that we apply are actually very accessible to anybody. While I was there, the eruption was taking place. It wasn't actually taking place and coming out at the crater itself. It was coming out at a, a fissure which was much nearer the coast. Uh, towards the end of uh, my time on the island, I was able to get a helicopter to take a, a flight across the, the fissure, so I was able to see what was happening uh, at first hand. Uh, my ability to take photographs in a, a helicopter with a closed door is not particularly good, but my colleagues in the United States Geological Survey are infinitely better at it. They also have helicopters with with open doors as well. And here is uh, some film footage that the USGS took of the fissure eruption. Here's the fissure itself. You see the steam coming out of various points, but at this point, fissure 8.8, 8, it was really, really producing large quantities of magma. And that was flowing down as it does, effectively just like a river of fire. But note, you know, it, it, it is very much like a river, you know, and dare, dare I say, like a braided river in some bits as well. But it, it is constrained, and there are parts which are, that still have fresh vegetation associated with them as well. And the fissure continues along here as well, in a, a number, uh, uh, all along here and out in, in that particular direction. And the this river of fire eventually, very quickly actually, reaches the sea and then it's building out new land. So Big Island is now significantly long. larger than it was when uh, I, uh, you know, being uh, flowing into the sea uh, and causing major evaporation at the time, uh, probably steam will, will be a bit acidic in its composition too. And of course it's changing the landscape. It's changing the landscape because of what it's doing to the vegetation. It's creating new bits of, of landscape. And I think, now I think it's, it's useful to reflect on what that uh, would impact that would have all round. 
One of the interesting things I think that happened during this eruption was that it wasn't at Kilauea itself and the crater that we saw the magma coming out. This is a photograph that was taken relatively recently in July this year, but I thought it was quite a spectacular photograph, so I, I like to put it in as well. There's a bit of steam that's been coming off, but very, very fine. And as a result of that, we have this beautiful, beautiful rainbow over the top. But you'll see that the crater lake is really quite deep now. So, you know, this, everything that was in this crater before has actually been, been drained away during the course of the eruption. So let's have a look at just what exactly must have happened. Well, there's magma coming up from a deep source, and we'll look at some evidence of that deep source uh, later on. Creating a magma chamber underneath the Kilauea uh, caldera. But in this particular case, rather than the magma forcing its way right up here and coming out at the caldera itself, it scooted off sideways in, in a rift and came out on this flank eruption here. And of course, on the flanks of the volcano, there is significant habitation. So this area, which was fairly well populated, had an impact not just as a, as a geological phenomena, but also something that had a, an impact on the people who were actually living there as well. So why, why, why do we have all this volcanic activity in Hawaii? Well, it comes down in the end to this hotspot. A hotspot which, as far as we know at present, is relatively stable in its position. So the hotspot resides there, quite quietly pushing up hot rock up to the surface. And on top of that, the oceanic crust is moving. So the oceanic crust is moving and it's moving in that direction. So the oldest volcanic activity we find is here. And then gradually, as we move towards Big Island, the volcanic activity gets younger and younger till we've got current day volcanic activity happening on Big Island. What's going to happen in the future? Well, if it doesn't continue on here, and Big Island's now one of the biggest of the Hawaiian chain, it will refocus on another island, which will be built somewhere out here. And we can begin to see that sort of thing happening uh, at the present day, certainly under the ocean. So the message is hot spot that remains steady, and the plate moves across the top of it. So that's the model, a relatively simple model, that is associated with the volcanism associated with Hawaii. I said that this stuff came from quite depth, significant depths. And uh, I think in, uh, there you do find mantle xenoliths that contain some absolutely beautiful crystals of, uh, of olivine. This is one from uh, from Hawaii, a rather poor photograph that I took, I'm afraid. And here's another two that uh, come from, from Lanzarote, which is a, a very similar sort of setting. But beautiful green crystals. And these crystals will be the sort of things which would have been forming at significant depths, will have been incorporated within the, the magma and taken from deep in the, well, certainly within the mantle, up to the surface and erupted within the, uh, the uh, volcanic lavas themselves. But what about the impact on people? This is another bit of film footage from the Hawaiian television service. And it shows what happened once the lava had quiesced. This is exactly the same coming out of it then. Now the magma has solidified. It's beginning to cool. You see that the topography is not dissimilar to what it was like when the, the magma was absolutely erupting. But also in the background, notice the confined nature of the, the lava flow itself. You know, with the forest lava flow, volcanic cones along the line of the fissure. 
Okay. And beaches right along the shoreline. New bits of small lava islands are among the new features. Completely cut the off. Community is debating whether or not it should be ripped as is, or if it should be dredged to make the boat ramp accessible again. So there you go. You can't take your boat out to sea anymore. The county is also considering if or when and where it should cut access roads across the new lava. There you go, access roads cut. cut off by the eruption. Like this home, just well, look at that. How lucky so was that guy? You know, the lava right effectively just flowed round about his, his house. All across Lower Puna, the color green is starting to return to the vegetation killed by the previous eruption of volcanic gases. And another example of As lava just having flown round, flowed round uh, a, a, a couple of farms. The states are being made available at Hawaii County Council Member Eileen O'Hara's office on Pahoa Village Road on Mondays and Wednesdays only. And on October 9th, the Pahoa Post Office says mail delivery will resume to portions of the Leilani Estate subdivision. But you know, there's still volcanic activity going on there. Right. So there we go. We've visited a few places. We've seen some volcanic activity. We've seen something of the impact of that volcanic activity on the people that actually live there. And this is only a tiny, tiny part of one of the processes, one of the many processes that shape the planet on which we all live. Uh, a planet which has got such a diverse landscape. And you know, you in Ireland, we in Scotland, have got a, a landscape that has been formed over three billion years, a landscape which has been formed by oceans opening, oceans closing, mountains being built and mountains being eroded away again. And within that, volcanic activity was just part of the process. And of course, living in a planet that is so diverse in its landscape means that we have, we share it with a whole lot of organisms that, uh, that actually are on our planet as well and take advantage of that landscape. And, you know, as you'll have been seeing on television recently, my, my hero, David Attenborough, has been pronouncing on the loss of biodiversity, which is taking place at the present time. And again, the other night I was looking at a lecture which was, was talking about the human impact on that as well. So I think it's worth just reflecting on just what this wonderful world that we live in is like. And I'm just going to finish up with a bit of film footage that was produced by David Attenborough that I find really quite moving. So I'll leave you with that. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue, clouds of white, bright blessed days, dark sacred night. I think to myself, so became the sky, but also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I watch them go.
there alone. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Quite simply wonderful. world and dynamic processes of actually helping to contribute to it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much Stuart. Can you hear me?